Uh, Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee of Wednesday, February 1st, 2023 to order. A quorum is present. In accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Uh, Senator Coleman, who will be um, uh, attending remotely from St. Paul, Minnesota, and Senator Lang, we'll say he's in Olivia, Minnesota. <laughs> All right. All right, um, members, um, today uh, we, uh, is a hearing. We're gonna hear from uh, an array of perspectives of individuals and organizations who wanna talk about what transportation means to the wide array of communities and people who live in Minnesota, how uh, transportation uh, can be uh, thought about, developed, uh, invested in, improved, um, so that it serves everyone. Uh, I'm fond of saying in my public comments as I go in various places or speak about transportation in committee on the, or on the floor that transportation is that thing that if we do very well, really does create greater connections, greater opportunity, enhances the shared prosperity, um, bolsters our economy in a way that, and uh, in our civic and community life in, in ways that everyone can participate in or it can do the exact opposite. Um, likewise, when you think about transportation from an environmental perspective, it can be a benefit uh, to our environment or uh, can do the exact opposite. So today uh, we have a number of folks who want to talk with us, share with us their perspectives on what transportation might mean to our lives, our shared life in Minnesota um, to do, the, the good, do it in a good way to improve lives. Uh, so with that, um, uh, I will just simply call folks up in the order you see them on the agenda with the exception of Commissioner Fernando, who we're gonna bump up a little bit in about the sixth or seventh slot. Um, so we will start off with, uh, and if, if folks can just follow the agenda, you'll see where your name comes up, just come forward as you see a seat uh, come available. Um, if you're next in queue, just come to the table. That way we'll save time because there's a lot of folks who want to share their thoughts with us today. Um, and I'll just say that uh, Commissioner Fernando will appear after Anthony Taylor. So you can slot in after Anthony Taylor. All right, so MJ Carpio, please come forward. And also if Will Shore and Peter Wagenius will come forward as well. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Chair Dibble and Senate Transportation Committee members. My name is MJ Carpio. I'm with Move Minnesota, an, organizing, an organization advocating for expanded public transit. Uh, we're also part of a coalition pushing for improved walking and biking infrastructure. Thank you so much for hosting a Transit Equity Day themed hearing. Um, Transit Equity Day, officially on February 4th, is actually on Rosa Parks' birthday. It's a celebration of the larger movement's accomplishment of advocating for transit as a civil right. Um, and yet, we have a long way to go. Equity in a societal and even, even legal sense means fairness, right? And if we're asking people to be full, mobile, contributing members of our economies, we also need to provide fair means to do so. And in a transit context, that means having access to bus or rail lines close to people's homes, that's number one. Number two, having frequent and reliable service. And number three, giving transit operators and support staff the incentives and tools to provide safety and accessibility measures for passengers. But speaking holistically, equity also means clean air, clean water, and a climate that won't perpetuate existing inequalities. And according to our own pollution control agency, transportation remains to be the number one source of pollution. And it's not rail or bus, it's cars, SUVs, pickups. And this is a problem that we have to address collectively. And it's not to say that cars don't have a place. I'm ex very, very, very grateful uh, for the carpool rides that have allowed me to explore Minnesota and go to places like the Boundary Waters, the Iron Range, Lake Superior, and so many other state parks. But as a lifelong public transit user, two years ago, I was actually forced to get a car and to supplement my transit use. And I acknowledge this, but this is different from car dependence. And designed purposeful car dependency is neither equitable nor sustainable. And I know that we can do better for people's mobility. 
we have the opportunity to be a leader in providing equitable means for people to participate in our economies and to enjoy the beautiful Minnesota. It's, and it's up to people in this room to realize that potential here in this state. And so today we'll hear more from transit riders and advocates about their experiences and from local and national experts about increasing access to, uh, to transit and reducing dependency on cars. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify and I'm looking forward to working with members of this committee um, to secure the necessary funding and policies to great public transit. Thank you very much. Great, thank you Ms. Carpio. Uh, Mr. Shore. Thank you, Chair Dibble and Senators. Thank you for having us here today, and I want to uh, thank MJ for her uh, incredibly valuable role in bringing us all together. Uh, that doesn't mean that Move Minnesota necessarily endorses everything that I'm about to say, but uh, I really do appreciate the organizational help. Um, I thought where I would start would be at around a sort of a 30,000-foot level and ask, can Minnesotans afford to go where they need to go? Now, uh, as MJ mentioned- Sure, if you could just introduce yourself formally for I'm very sorry, <laughs> I'm just so eager to dive in. Will Schroer, Executive Director, East Metro Strong. We are an organization of employers, cities, counties, and uh, uh, working for better transit and transportation, especially in the East Metro, but really all across Minnesota. Thank you for that prompt, Senator Dibble. So again, let me start at a 30,000 foot and ask if we can, uh, if we as Minnesotans can afford to get where we need to go. Um, uh, equity has a lot of different components uh, and the financial one is an important one. It's not the only one, but the, that's the one I'd like to focus on briefly today. <clears throat> Uh, and the approach I'd like to take, uh, you're going to hear some more technical uh, discussions. I'd like to just take the ripped from the headlines uh, approach. And uh, last year, there was a lot of uh, discussion in the news that used cars had literally become unaffordable. And a lot of that discussion was around the price of the car, but um, CNN did a nice job of reminding everyone that the price was only half of it. The other half was, uh, how did that price relate to your income? And if your income uh, didn't keep up with prices, uh, then the car uh, was literally becoming unaffordable. Uh, since then, some of the... Um, uh, headlines have suggested that car prices have, have come down, and I want to take a closer look at that claim with you. They have come down a little bit from their uh, tippy-top peak. They went up again uh, two weeks ago. Uh, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is that wherever they are uh, compared to 2021 or even 2020, they're way above where they were uh, uh, 10 years ago. And I haven't met anybody in this line of work, uh, or the car line of work for that matter, uh, that thinks they're going to get back down to that, that old baseline. We have entered a new period of it's really expensive to, bo to own uh, a car, even a used car, and that really changes people's calculus. Uh, so that was last year. Can Minnesotans afford a, a, a car now? Uh, AAA, which uh, you have your own opinions about which side of uh, you know the the spectrum they come from, but um, they're well known as relatively objective source of uh, of costs anyway. And they set a new record this year. It's ten thousand dollars a year to to operate, own, and operate a new car uh, for the first time ever. Uh, this year. As I mentioned, used car prices are, are falling, but interest rates are going up, uh, uh, and so the, the net effect is not just a wash. It means that actually used cars are even more expensive now than they were last year when everyone was tearing their hair out about how unaffordable they were. Uh, and so the bottom line is that if you're in the market for a used car because uh, you're watching your budget and so you, you're not going to buy a new one, uh, you're in uh, for about $500 a month or at least uh, $6,000 a year uh, just to own the car, not, a, not uh, maintain or put gas in it. Uh, so if you don't have that $6,000, uh, do you have options to, as MJ said, still participate in society, to go to work, to go to school, to get groceries, to see your family? And uh, there are a range of different options across the Minnesota, but let's put them in two different buckets. Uh, in the metro region, uh, Greater MSP uh, agrees that to be a healthy place, we, we need to, to be close uh, to jobs by transit. And only, uh, and they set a metric for that, and that metric has fallen since 2016. So even as that, even it has become more expensive to own a car, the options available to you if you don't own a car have gotten worse. 
Uh, and in, in greater Minnesota, uh, MnDOT, also a, a, an excellent source of objective information, has, uh, uh, they're annually uh, reviewing the needs for transit in greater Minnesota. Uh, they've delineated those needs and they've said that we are about $350 million away from meeting those needs. So again, if you don't have a car, uh, the options are not there. Uh, I've been privileged to be part of a, a group uh, run by Washington County, the government of Washington County, called Go Washington, and they, they survey their residents and uh, run really excellent um, uh, events as well where they can meet folks. And uh, they came out with this report literally just earlier this week, and I want to share this page of it from you, uh, because they translate those numbers on the previous three slides into real human impacts. Um, uh, this this uh, person from Hugo cannot get, afford to go to the doctor, cannot afford to go to the doctor, is cut off from medical services because uh, they don't have any options. Um, this person can't go see my family. Um, uh, and uh, this story gets told over and over in Washington County, whether you are in Stillwater, uh, whether you are in Oakdale, whether you're in Hugo, uh, and I think that's representative of sort of a broader swath of Minnesota. There are urban areas, there are suburban, and there are rural, and there aren't really very good choices in any of those um, uh, uh, across the board in those areas. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap, if I may, with uh, uh, a headline from Bloomberg. Uh, and this was a headline from just earlier, that uh, because of everything that I just went through, they, they note that cars are, or Americans are falling behind on their, their auto payments and repossessions are climbing, and that therefore Americans are forced to make tough choices. And here's the photo that Bloomberg uh, used to illustrate the choice. It's have a car or don't have a car. Those are your choices. It's not have a car, don't have a car and take transit, don't have a car and walk, don't have a car and bike. These are the choices that, that Bloomberg sees. I would like to think there are more choices than that, but that's the choice that unfortunately is all too real for too many people in Minnesota. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shore. Mr. Wiginius. I'm gonna ask MJ to help me put up the right presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Peter Wiginius. I'm the Legislative Director of Sierra Club. I'm also a member of the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council uh, convened by the Commissioner of Transportation. So how can we effectively, cost-effectively expand equitable access across Minnesota's metro area? It's simple. We can scale up and replicate the success we're already having with bus rapid transit in Minnesota. BRT works in many areas. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the Twin Cities metro area in part because when it comes to VMT in increases, the metro area is the problem. Fortunately, the metro area is also the solution. If the legislature is willing to fund BRT, we can build it quickly. We can fund it through a sales tax only in the metro area. These books are resources that people have used nationwide because bus neglect is a nationwide problem. Minnesota is not immune from this. There are inaccurate stereotypes about buses and the people who ride them, which are used to perpetuate that neglect. I won't repeat them except for one example. Buses, some claim, are slow and unreliable, as if that's some kind of inherent quality. No, if buses are slow, it's because of policy choices. Fortunately, Minnesota has every model needed to build a complete transit network. There are three forms of BRT in the region already, two in operations and one under, under construction. I'll go through each of the three quickly, but first, the obligatory disclaimer that the bus versus rail debate is not helpful. Ask me later if you want detail on that, but let's dive in. Gold Line, currently under construction from the eastern suburbs to downtown St. Paul, is an example of Guideway BRT. The key feature of Guideway BRT is its dedicated lane, which provides speed and reliability. 
Think of Guideway BRT as like LRT, except on rubber tires. The second form of BRT is Highway BRT, an orange line started in 2021 from Burnsville's heart of the city to downtown Minneapolis. The key feature here that allows for speed and reliability is that most of the corridor is in HOT lanes on 35W. This is much faster. When we were building the orange line, we like to say it's time to put transit in the fast lane. I won't, uh, I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides for time, but just to note one good quality of highway BRT is that we can finally serve communities of color that were deliberately cut up and or bypassed by the initial freeway construction. The third form of BRT is arterial, which is used on city streets, not necessarily in its own lane. Some would say that means it's technically not BRT, but whatever you call it, it's extremely valuable. It's a vital upgrade on corridors with existing bus service, which was or is needlessly slow. There's a lot you can do to improve speed, reliability, and the rider experience. The number one thing riders want is frequency, which affects your overall travel time the most. Not every trip is to a nine to five job, so service on evenings and weekends is crucial. The other features listed here, common to all forms of BRT, improve speed even without a dedicated lane, although that is also a choice, which we have made strategically uh, in the region. Arterial BRT is a proven winner on increasing ridership. That includes regaining pandemic ridership faster than other modes. These projects succeed because they provide riders what they've been asking for. We've mentioned most of these, but it's worth highlighting sidewalks so people can get to stations. Many streets approaching suburban transit stations do not have sidewalks. That's one of the many reasons that the, trans the transit funding package needs to continue to include a 10% set aside for walking and biking as this community committee has approved in the past. Thank you. When you put all these features together, you have expanded freedom for many people whose mobility, whose freedom is needlessly limited. People's freedom of movement is something we can measure, by the way, from any destination. This is a map of freedom uh, in downtown Portland showing all the places you can get to just through transit and walking in 15, 30, and 45-minute increments. It's important to know different forms of BRT serve different markets. Arterial BRT is planned in core cities and inner ring suburbs. The other types of BRT can go much farther out from, from the core if we build them, this is a map of arterial BRT in those uh, communities. It's worth noting, though, that both arterial BRT and highway BRT were studied a decade ago and network plans for each were developed. But only the arterial BRT network has been advanced slowly by Metro Transit. The other modes have mostly been advanced by counties, cities, and legislators. Highway BRT is effectively an orphan in need of adoption. The 2024, 2014 plan is currently sitting on a shelf. To conclude, bus neglect is something we can fix, but it didn't come from nowhere. It comes from biases in transportation policy. I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to list all five. I'm just going to quickly highlight two. The fourth, governance by equality of jurisdiction rather than equality of people. We will not get equity in public policy on transportation if people are not represented equally in the decision-making process. For example, when votes are allocated on decision-making boards by jurisdictions, regardless of population, rather than by population itself, then people are no longer equal. Ask any resident of Ramsey County, do they think they are less than one-fifth of a person compared to a resident of Carver County? I think they'll say no. Hennepin County residents are not one-twelfth of a person compared to residents of Carver County or any other county. One person, one vote is a simple principle that you can all use in developing governance decisions that will promote equity. One person, one vote is also the tool that allowed you all to be here taking this presentation from us, and thank you very much for that. Uh, second and finally, uh, the obvious bias in decision-making process is allocation by mode. We spend a ton of money on roads, sometimes millions of dollars at intersections to prevent four, you know, 45 seconds of delay but we don't have a problem with 45 minutes of delay on transit corridors. We can address that by funding transit, regardless of mythologies that have hold, held us back in the past. The number one mythology that holds us back is that transit is subsidized, but roads are not. This is not true. The user fees that cover transit 
just like the user fees that cover roads don't cover all the costs. But the user fees that cover roads don't come close to covering the cost of roads. But we don't think twice about that. We should get past this notion that one is subsidized and the other is not. They both are. And instead embrace efficiency, effectiveness, sustainability, and equity. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to testify. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wagenius. All right, so next we will ask uh, Ben Holland, Anthony Taylor, and Hennepin County Board Chair Irene Fernando to come forward. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, for com committee, for uh, having me. Um, my name is Ben Holland. I work for RMI, formerly known as Rocky Mountain Institute. Really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the connection between climate change and equity, um, and really kind of express uh, the importance of transit equity as a climate solution. Um, just quickly, uh, because I'm an out-of-towner, um, just some background on RMI. Um, we are a 40-year-old nonprofit focused on energy environment. We work on cross sectors of the energy system. Um, our connection really to the state of Minnesota is our energy policy simulator, which is a tool we recently developed that was used by the state of Minnesota to uh, create the climate action framework. Um, we've been really excited about the work that you're doing here, looking forward to um, collaborating with the um, state of Minnesota and other groups on the ground here. Um, I'm also representing in a coalition that we co-lead called America is All, is All In. Um, this is the largest coalition of its kind, represents or, or it encompasses businesses, governments, um, cultural institutions, all really dedicated to driving climate and equity solutions. Um, so on the subject of climate and equity, um, of course, we're familiar with a number of the impacts that climate has on uh, people today. Uh, adverse health effects, especially around uh, exposure to pollution, disaster risks uh, such as flooding, um, resource allocation, resource access, and uh, affordability issues. But I think what I want to get across the, for the most part is just how this disproportion disproportionately affects um, low-income communities, communities of color, and, and other dis disadvantaged communities. Um, those communities tend to be uh, in kind of the line of fire, if you will, of of climate impacts and pollution. A great example of that is highways and um, highway expansions and how that affects these communities. Um, on uh, where Minnesota stands as far as uh, their climate goals, I, I think uh, many people in this room will be familiar or um, would have heard the news yesterday that Minnesota has uh, made a significant amount of progress toward reducing carbon emissions. Um, still though, if we, were to, if we were to hit those goals, we need to uh, see a great deal more progress made on the front of transit equity and transportation climate solutions. That is because despite the um, great success that the power bill has had in reducing electricity emissions, transportation in Minnesota, just like the United States, remains kind of a stubborn sector um, for reducing emissions. It is the largest uh, contributor to carbon emissions in Minnesota as it is in the U.S. and um, you know, the state of Minnesota has done a, a lot of great work to address these uh, transportation climate issues. In particular, the clean cars rule um, will go a long way toward uh, tackling uh, the emissions associated with personal vehicles. Um, however, our analysis suggests that even under very op optimistic um, and ambitious electric vehicle adoption scenarios, we still really need to provide alternatives to vehicle ownership. and. Um, and reduce vehicle miles traveled. The infrastructure law, the recently passed infrastructure law, provides some funding to do just that. However, if it's used in a way that sort of promotes kind of the status quo um, approach to transportation investments, um, we anticipate that emissions could actually increase. When I say status quo, I mean a transportation kind of set of transportation priorities that are really focused on highway expansions instead of multimodal access and. Uh, improvements to the trans uh, transit system. Um, and on that transit system, uh, Minnesota, just like other states around the country, you're not alone in this, um, has a funding gap about $350 million for, for transit. In order to sufficiently address the climate problem, we also need to address this gap and scale up our investment 
uh, for uh, investment in uh, transit and multimodal access. I just want to quickly touch on a uh, planning standard that was created in my home state of Colorado that I that we hope you will uh, look into. This is a um, this is standard that basically the state of Colorado set a, um, a series of standards for all MPOs within the state, uh, pollution reduction standards, I should say, and then for across the board for those uh, sets of mitigation targets, basically shifting investments from uh, sort of the status quo highway expansion model to transit and multi multimodal access. And how they did this was really allocating $1.5 billion um, in funding that was to go to two different projects in um, Colorado, highway expansion projects, and, and put that towards BRT and multimodal. Um, and our partners at SWEEP, Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, found that the current Colorado emissions rule will produce $40 billion in savings, largely from reduced commuting costs um, for, for drivers and um, non-vehicle owners across the state. Um, Minnesota, we'd like to sort of impress upon you, has the opportunity to tap into $200 billion competitive discretionary fund through the infrastructure law. Um, significant amount of funding available when uh, transportation projects are developed around the pr principles of energy or environment, safety, and equity. Um, and I would just kind of close down, uh, finish up by saying that this is not just an urban issue or a problem that can be solved in cities, but that it is shared at the rural level as well. Uh, three quarters of rural residents are below the median uh, income level and are disproportionately affected by the um, impacts of uh, transportation uh, and the cost of transportation. So just to close, we think that by adopting a similar greenhouse gas planning standard, Minnesota can lead the Midwest, advance equity, and achieve climate goals. And I will end there. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Holland. Um, members, I, I should have said, and I failed to, and I haven't been calling for questions. Um, I'm not necessarily gonna call for questions after each speaker, but would invite you to raise your hand and ask questions after each speaker if you're so moved. All right, thanks. All right, uh, Mr. Taylor, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Dibble, and uh, good afternoon, uh, committee. Uh, my name is Anthony Taylor, and I am here um, uh, representing our organization, the Cultural Water Center. We're a South Minneapolis-based organization, um, but we really work actively connecting communities of color from east side all the way to Ely, really to take advantage of our outdoors, uh, the benefits of outdoors uh, that we've made, um, but more importantly, the inf infrastructure we've developed towards active living uh, in our communities. I really consider myself uh, a cyclist who has grown into being a transportation advocate, who has grown into being a mobility justice advocate, um, as I've realized really what is happening in terms of what we build and what we build affects the quality of life that people in our communities. Uh, I have an evil plan um, that we will uh, partner and fund transportation done well um, and talk about that as mobility, um, that, that we will understand that mobility, understand mobility is central to creating equitable and economic vitality and ultimately uh, impact and quality of life in all of our communities. Mobility justice demands that we fully excavate, recognize, and reconcile the historical and current injustices experienced by our communities um, with impact to communities given um, space and resources to envision and uh, implement planning models and political activity uh, that works to address historical and current injustices experienced by those communities. I acknowledge that transportation and mobility can be interpreted in a multitude of ways, but at its core, mobility is the ability to move or be moved freely and easily. This is good transportation, and we believe that all people have a right to mobility. This includes disabled folks, uh, migrant communities, immigrant communities, uh, people experiencing homelessness, youth, elders, and other groups that have been historically confined in their mobility for a variety of socio and political reasons. A person's ability to move around freely is directly tied to their access to opportunities, such as jobs, education, affordable housing, affordable health care. I would say that this is also the foundation of good transportation. If a person's transportation options cannot physically get them to their appointments to attend school, to connect to the important assets in their communities, then mobility is constrained. 
if an individual has limited or no access to transportation and mobility options, they will also likely have less access to power and decision-making processes. Mobility and transportation done well are lifelines of healthy communities of opportunity. As we work together, as you make decisions and work deeply to increase options for funding transportation, well, let's say mobility, and transit, bicycling, walking, and specifically, please consider that transit-oriented development is intersectional in nature because the impacts access opportunities such as jobs, education, affordable housing, um, affordable health care, and active living. And they all provide communities of opportunities uh, like ours, all of ours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for all your work over the years. So, um, uh, very honored to welcome the chair of the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners, Irene Fernando. Chair Dibble, Senators, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and thanks to all of the advocates and residents for including me. I'm Commissioner Irene Fernando. I use she or pronouns and represent District 2, which includes Plymouth, Medicine Lake, Golden Valley, St. Anthony Village, and Minneapolis. I'm the first Filipino-American elected in Minnesota. I'm the youngest woman to serve on the Hennepin County Board, and I'm the first person of color to serve as board chair since Hennepin's founding in 1852. I'm dedicated to advancing equity by advocating for those who are marginalized or structurally disenfranchised. And these identities and dedication greatly inform my testimony today. It is good government to follow the data and eliminate disparities by whatever means possible. This requires a systemic approach, embedding equity directly into decision making and removing inequities in policies that are barriers to equal opportunity. Historically, our transit system heavily prioritized suburban commuters coming in and out of downtown, as well as riders who are able to choose transit. Given the shifts in work locations and patterns, as well as a growing chasm in household income levels, it requires equitable design that has a deeper commitment to workers and families so that night shift healthcare workers can travel safely, elderly can ride confidently, and a parent with grocery bags and a toddler can efficiently get home. Transit investment from the state alongside counties and municipalities can advance equity through economic and housing development, which we are de demonstrating with the Blue Line Extension Light Rail. The Blue Line will serve communities who are transit reliant, racially diverse, and have felt long-lasting impacts of historic redlining and disinvestment. We are showing that alongside transit investments, Hennepin can generate deeply affordable housing units for residents, can ignite economic development for small businesses, and can build wealth for working families for generations to come. Meaningful transmit, transit investment from the state can change the trajectory of what's possible for our shared residents and for Minnesotans. There are transformational benefits from climate action to construction jobs to improved health and educational outcomes. And so Hennepin stands ready to support uh, the efforts that you take alongside community. Mr. Chair and members, thanks for your leadership and remaining steadfast with your commitment to transit equity and for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much for being here. Next up, we will have uh, Amity Foster, Michelle Molstead, and Jillian Nelson. Greetings, Senator Dibble and committee. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, and committee members. My name is Amity Foster, and I'm a member of Isaiah. I live in Northeast Minneapolis in SD60, and I've been transit reliant for more than 20 years. There's a lot of research into how public transit builds equity in our communities and how it can be a system that addresses past inequities. I want to speak to you about the community of public transit. I am part of it because when you see the same people every day, you are part of that community. I've seen people at their most mundane, their best, and our worst. Public transit is also where I've seen the inequities in other systems play out in housing, jobs, healthcare, and safety. I thought about what stories I wanted to share with you, what illustrates transit inequity and equity. I could tell you sad stories about missing friends because I can't get to them on the bus or train, the times I've taken transit and tried to figure out how to help someone who is in distress, but I couldn't. I actually want to tell you about a guy I see fairly regularly on the 11. He's older. I know people who would see him and they would be scared. He's a big guy, a little bit unkempt. You know the stereotypes that I'm talking about. But 
Once I started to ride the bus again after the COVID restrictions lifted, he saw me and told me he was worried about me and glad to see me, glad to know that I was still around. There's a lot of conversation right now about transit being unsafe, and these are real concerns. We should not dismiss them as discomforts. But I wanna highlight the community of transit because when we address needs through the lens of community, we're also addressing them with an equity lens. An equitable transit system is one that is safe, affordable, and accessible by all who ride it and operate it. An equitable transit system is also one that is fully funded with long-term dedicated funding because we have decided to make transit equity a priority, not an afterthought. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. All right, uh, Michelle Molstead. Chair Dibble and committee members, uh, Michelle Molstead, Move Minnesota volunteer. Thank you for taking your time to listen and for making decisions about transit in Minnesota based on good data and helpful stories. Uh, today I learned, according to Google, uh, that I can visit every uh, committee member's district by transit, which was a pleasant surprise and an intriguing project. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, Over eight years ago, I moved out here from the Pacific Northwest on Amtrak with two pieces of luggage and a bicycle. I left my 84 Honda Accord hatchback stick shift behind because I wasn't sure how long I'd stay and I didn't want it to get rusty, which my friends from Staples said it might. Uh, my car is still not here, uh, partly because it was so easy to get to the places I needed to go by walking, biking, and transit. Uh, true confessions, I did not take transit today. Uh, I rode my bike, it's uh, nice outside, it's not far, and it was faster, and I'm a little embarrassed about that. So. <clears throat> On the ride over, I was thinking about what to say, uh, what stories about the transit community to tell. Um, the little community I had uh, at the bus stop waiting for the 65 on Dale at 5.30 in the morning talking about food or how great or lousy the Vikings games uh, were the night before. But I keep returning to the testimony from Janice Watts of Fresh Energy two years ago at the House Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. In discussing Rosa Parks, Claudette Colvin, and Transit Equity Day, uh, Ms. Watts used the phrase, freedom to travel. Freedom to travel is a value I'm confident everyone on this committee and in this room shares. Thank you, Chair Dibble uh, and committee members for centering transit policy around the freedom to travel for everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Jillian Nelson. Good afternoon, Chair Devil and Committee. My name is Jillian Nelson. I'm with the Autism Society of Minnesota. I am also an autistic adult. I'm here today to talk about transportation from a disability lens. This week I've been driving, spending my mornings driving my partner's eight-year-old son to school. This is not part of my normal routine but his papa currently has a cornea injury and cannot drive. As I drive, I think, a lot. <laughs> um, I only got my license four years ago because of my disability. Before that, I was dependent on public transportation. I forgot how much that controlled my life, where I could live, where I could work, what access I had to medical care, and how time-consuming it was. If my partner did not have my help, he would spend nearly five hours a day on buses, just getting his son to school, then going to work, then returning them both home. They are both also autistic. This is not an accessible way of living. Caesar has a temporary disability, but his situation reminds us how fragile we are as humans. The disability community is the only marginalized group that anyone can join at any time within a split second. Including, and in fact centering, accessibility and transportation planning isn't just about equity for those living with disabilities now. It's about ensuring that transportation isn't a piece of the crisis when someone joins our community. It ensures that disability does not have to cut people off from their homes or their jobs or isolate them from their community. 
including disability and the transportation growth of, in our state allows vibrant access and living for all people throughout our entire state. I urge all of you to consider what your life would look like if you did not have that option. If you had to depend on public transportation, how long would it have taken you to get here today? If you couldn't get here, where would you work instead? Would you be able to visit your favorite places, your family, your friends? And then consider, would that even be possible if you were in a wheelchair or had a mobility challenge? Would it be possible if you had sensory needs? And what would the cost be? What would you be willing to sacrifice to pay that cost? These are the questions that the disability community has to answer every single day. We can change that with equitable and vibrant transportation. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. All right, next up we have uh, Teresa Nix, Hannah Zinn, and Sean Lim. I only see two people, so <laughs> who uh, is one of you, uh, Teresa Nix? Nope. Then we'll go with Hannah Zinn. Right. Chair Dibble and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the importance of investing in a strong and equitable transit network. My name is Hannah Zinn, and I'm the public policy manager at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Over the past 10 years, the Minneapolis Regional Chamber and our partners have commissioned studies from national experts to assess the expected return on investment from building out our region's transit system, such as a comprehensive transit system in our metro area, providing more than $9 billion in positive direct economic impact. It's important to note that our most recent study found that 81% of the benefits of a better transit system would be enjoyed by people and businesses using the region's street and highway system due to reduced traffic, thus avoiding costly disruptions like, serv like shipping delays and long daily commutes. Nearly two thirds believe that transit is necessary to compete with other metro areas for jobs. 64% said that the MSP region needs a better transit system to compete for jobs with peer cities such as Denver, Salt Lake City, Dallas, and Portland. We know that businesses prefer to locate near transit where employees and customers will have more travel options. This is especially critical as businesses continue to diversify their workforces and are looking for ways to better attract and retain talent in a tight labor market. It must be noted that the way we think about our transit system looks different than it did just a few years ago. It's true that the pandemic and shift to remote work decimated demand for public transit in the Twin Cities and across the country. It's also true that the current design and operating hours of our transit systems mean you, means using transit is not an option for those who never stopped going to work, such as healthcare workers and those in the service and hospitality industry. As we think about building an equitable transit system of the future, we need to think about building systems that are more than just getting workers to and from their jobs. We need systems that allow people to go to a doctor's appointment, the grocery store, out to dinner, or to a sporting event. To put it plainly, it's no longer enough to build a system that only gets people from point A to point B. We need a system that gets people from point A to C to D, E, and F, and back to A again. We are hopeful that policymakers will recognize the significant benefits that comes with transit and will make smart choices and in investments that benefit everyone in the region. Thank you for focusing on this very important issue, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Zinn. Any questions, members? Um, another thing that occurs to me is um, if any, anyone who testifies would like to submit their comments um, to either Ms. Ethier or Mr. Will in order to make it a part of the public record, we'll post those, that testimony if it's written um, to the committee website so that others can review your comments and it'll be made a part of the official record as well. Likewise for the uh, PowerPoint presentations, are they already up? Yes, okay. PowerPoint presentations are at the committee website. Um, all right, so next up we have Sean Lim. Welcome. 
Thank you, <clears throat> Chair Dibble and committee members. Thank you for having us. My name is Sean Lim. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a community organizer at 23 years old. I'm also the program director at the Minnesota Youth Collective, an organization which seeks to build the political power of young people here in Minnesota. I also hold a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences, Policy, and Management from the U of M. I am a lifelong transit user and bike commuter. I have never owned a car and don't plan on buying one in the foreseeable future. That means that in sweltering heat and in sub-zero cold, whether it's traveling across uh, the Twin Cities, getting across Minneapolis and St. Paul, or visiting friends up north in Duluth, I get where I need to go by bike, bus, and train. That's how I got here today. Young Minnesotans, especially those in high school, in college, and in our workforce, depend heavily on transit to get to class, work, run their errands, visit family, socialize, and, back, and get back home in a safe, efficient, reliable, and affordable manner. Transit equity is indeed an environmental, racial, and socioeconomic justice issue. So because of that, I hope that this session, the legislature will advance bills to allocate portions of our historic uh, budget surplus towards making transit equity a reality. This includes lowering fares, getting us on a path towards free public transportation with free, uh, zero fare pilot programs, solving our bus driver shortage uh, in Metro Transit by increasing their wages, implementing fare, uh, fare decriminalization, increasing service frequency, resuming routes that were terminated during the pandemic, adding new ones to historically and system systematically underserved, under-resourced, and marginalized communities, and more. Personally, I have witnessed how Metro Transit Police mistreat our unhoused neighbors simply seeking warmth and shelter. That is why we need a transit ambassador program that provides social services instead of policing riders. I've also visited multiple municipalities across the globe and observed how significant investment and prioritization of transit infrastructure from Ciudad de Mexico to Singapore to Paris have uplifted residents and citizens standard of living. I believe that it is imperative and incumbent upon us to set the foundational groundwork for subsequent generations and posterity to have a society where they not just make it by, uh, but fully thrive. That begins with transit equity. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Appreciate your thoughts and your ideas. Um, I'll mention to um, those here um, at, at the end of the list of those who have signed up ahead of time to testify. Um, I'll invite anyone else who wants to testify forward in case you need that amount of time to screw up your courage or collect your thoughts. All right, uh, Luther Winder, Paul Binberg, and Asha Salah will be the next three testifiers. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair, committee members. Thank you um, for the opportunity to speak today. Mr. Winder, if you can lean a little closer to the microphone. Sorry about that. Thanks. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity today to speak on Transit Equity Day. I'm Luther Winder, Chief Executive Officer at Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. We support an equitable system that is affordable, sustainable, and comprehensive that reliably connects people in all communities, including communities of people in the suburbs, to places that they need to travel. This issue is important to me both professionally and personally due to my life's work and being one of the few transit decision makers of color in the region. Transit is an inclusive service that welcomes everyone, but must be available to everyone. The pandemic exposed a real and unanswered need to, due to the change of demographics in the suburban communities. I was able to meet those needs prior to the pandemic due to lack of funding, and I spoke about that at numerous events and opportunities. Since 1996, over 350 affordable housing units have been built in our region over 180 communities. Less than 20% of those affordable housing communities have been built in the core and urban centers. That's 80% have been built in suburban, suburban edge communities, 25% of which have been built in our 12 STA communities. In 2019, prior to the pandemic, trying to adapt to these needs to connect individuals who needed service, MVTA following the likes of Southwest with their prime service started our MVTA Connect 
We started with two retired buses that were passed through for knife, and it's now grown to 19 buses, of which six are passed through for life, and as I talked to my operating officer, five are in the shop right now. Ridership has increased by over 130%. The vast majority of these Connect customers are women, people earning less than $50,000 a year, approximately 20% earn less than $15,000 a year. Our reverse commute that we've talked about and got demonstration funding back last in 2017, those customers are predominantly people of color. Move Minnesota highlighted that only a small fraction of jobs are reachable by transit in 60 minutes or less. Express and microtransit are some of the fastest modes in the region complemented by BRT. Express and microtransit routes um, for are short and distance between people and their jobs. Trans providers like myself are now faced with a decision on how to continue to meet the demands of microtransit and continue to boost other services that they continue to return, like Express, as riders return. We can't do both, we never have. So for MVTA, transit equity means inclusion in overall regional funding that includes electrification to help serve and provide better air quality in our Justice 40 communities, as well as that I serve. There are some in Samaritan communities. We do have some in Minnesota. We have one in Minnesota Valley Transit Authority Service Area, as well as needs for transit amenities to meet the needs today, as well as the needs of the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Winder. Welcome to the committee. Uh, uh, Senator Dibble and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Paul Bernberg. Uh, I'm a retired landlord tenant attorney. Um, I've testified before to the legislature, but always on landlord tenant law. Today I'm coming as just a guy, a guy from <laughs> Minneapolis. Um, and I want to make a few points. One is, uh, this hearing is partly uh, set out to be in honor of Rosa Parks, and I want to remind everybody here why she got arrested. She got arrested because she wanted to use the Montgomery, Alabama bus system because it was a good system. She just wanted to use it equally with whites. And we should have that same goal in this state to have a good transit system. What does this mean? One, decent funding like we fund our roads. Secondly, there's some things we can do like uh, priority uh, um, tr override of uh, the uh, traffic lights for buses, bus lanes only. Um, so i just make a few points on my own behalf. One, I'm gonna point out the obvious, but every time I take transit because, instead of driving my, my car, because I, it doesn't take forever to take the transit that particular route, I'm spewing much less carbon dioxide into the air. I'm reducing global warming. Uh, secondly, when I've got to get back from the airport or the train station or somebody, and uh, the only alternative to transit is a taxi, and I can take transit, I save a bunch of money, as well as saving the environment. Um, it's even true if, when I could drive someplace. Um, lastly, when I take transit, it's safer than driving. I mean, the traffic, the, ac the accidents and transit is much less than driving. And it also lets me do other things like read books or the newspaper or prepare for my talk today as I took the LRT here. And lastly, I make one point on behalf of my son. He lives in St. Cloud. He doesn't own a car. He can get around St. Cloud pretty well because the bus system's not bad up there. But he has business appointments down here and they're a pain in the neck to get down here, and sometimes you can't make them without a car. Decent transit, I think, would change that. So I appreciate your time as the, as the only person, maybe today, who's just a person to testify today, and I thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and your thoughts. I don't see Asha Sala, but I do understand uh, Teresa Nix is back in the room. So I'll invite Teresa Nix forward. Welcome. Committee and chair, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Hi, my name is Teresa Nix and I'm program manager over at Move Minnesota. My focus is building and strengthening relationships with transit riders, a lot of whom are here today. I take public transit frequently and I understand on a personal level that the struggle 
that goes along with it can be real. I would like to voice my concerns regarding all my fellow transit riders who were at the bus stop with me who didn't have options for shelter. I feel on some level that we have abandoned those without alternatives. This is not DC or San Francisco or Miami. This is Minnesota and it is cold. It's really cold. They depend on frequent reliable transportation and do not have the means to be sheltered or to get around otherwise. Our, it's our duty to protect those who are most vulnerable and ensure their protection and longevity. Even in my everyday transit, I have been impacted. Taking transit is becoming less and less appealing as the routes near my home become less frequent. To protect our climate and transit interests, public transportation has to be a feasible option for being an alternative to get anywhere we wanna go. And I mean anywhere. I wish I could tell you how deeply in my soul that I feel transit needs to work better. So you're just gonna have to believe me. We do better as everyone rises. Please fund transit now so we can improve the system, connectivity, and prevent long wait times. And I mean long, in the cold. Perhaps worst of this winter is behind us, but there are winters to come, and they keep coming. My hope is that one day, one winter, all those transit riders whose stories that I carry in my bones will have one less worry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Nix. All right, uh, moving on, we have, uh, uh, let's see, Sonia Perez Lauterbach, uh, Ricardo Perez, and Sherry Munyon. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to share. My name is Sonia Perez Lauterbach and I am a resident of Near North, and I live and work right off of Olson Memorial Highway. I wanna highlight the great opportunity and the exciting time we have to improve the well-being of our community by addressing how inf our infrastructure dollars are invested. As it stands now, Olson Memorial Highway is a barrier to community building safety and economic growth for those who live, work, and play near that highway. One fourth of my neighbors do not have access to a car, and yet there are no bike lanes, no transit lanes, and no commerce in that area to meet the needs of the community. The six lanes for cars make it incredibly difficult for my children to cross the road to Harrison Park. And it's not just my children, it's the hundreds of students that attend the two schools and the multiple daycares right in that area. Those children suffer from the impact of pollution and the adverse impact of living near a high speed street. I see the traffic from my office window in my home and I hear the crashes. We can do better to create a safer, more hospital road there. Thanks to the work of our streets and their mobile museum, I learned that at one point, that road was called Sixth Avenue. It was a place of music, commerce, and community. I urge the support of legislation that studies reparative solutions to include replacing highways for community-oriented streets and to give the land back to community so that it can be redeveloped in ways that benefit residents and ensures that our roads enable thriving and wellness, not injury and isolation. This is what makes our community safer. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, Ms. Munyon. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Sherry Munyon. I represent the Minnesota Public Transit Association. While it would have been nice to have a transit director speak to you today, or to have transit riders from Greater Minnesota, that wasn't possible. Short staffing prevented transit directors from leaving their offices, and one of them is actually backfilling in the dispatching office. 
Unfortunately, this is not an unusual occurrence due to the lack of funding for Greater Minnesota Transit and the lack of staffing both in the office as well as for drivers. By increasing investment in public transit across the state, we can economically, we can address economic and geographic inequity and provide greater access to our citizens in communities large, small, urban, suburban, and rural. Yes, COVID resulted in decreased ridership across the state, but that does not mean the need for transit investment went down. Greater Minnesota systems are understaffed and existing inequities in transit services were exacerbated by the pandemic. Other riders should not experience reduced access to the basics such as groceries, healthcare, job access, et cetera, due to the downturn. There is a lot of interest in purchasing electric vehicles to reduce air pollution, yet there is a very serious lack of capital being provided to do so, again, particularly in greater Minnesota, and even more so now with the increased cost of buying vehicles. Our transit systems across the state have seen an increase of at least 30% on the purchase of buses. And this applies to orders which had already been in and committed to. However, even though the contract was for the lower amount, the suppliers have said they can't be sold at that rate any longer. Communities have varying financial resources and the required 15 to 20% match required for both vehicles and operations creates inequities throughout greater Minnesota as well. Lack of resources results in lack of drivers and lack of buses. Greater Minnesota needs significant financial investment for those new buses, technology upgrades, staffing shortages, planning of their systems and facilities, et cetera. Greater Minnesota Transit serves businesses and the communities. This isn't just about the riders. It moves people to jobs, people to community colleges, and children to daycare, and grocery stores, and barbers, et cetera. We seek the necessary state match to meet federal funds. However, one-time money that allows for increased services only be taken away when the money runs out will lose the trust of riders that they can get to school, work, et cetera. Ongoing operations and budget replace, bus replacements requires dedicated, sustainable funding systems that can be counted on year after year, in addition to the necessary match for federal funds. Also, inadequate levels of funding throughout the state end up having transit and transportation advocates coveting each other's funding sources, rather than being able to meet all their needs without doing that. Public transit will never be funded properly if it's only viewed as an option for the have-nots, those without a car. Transit is not solely an alternative designed to meet the needs of low-income, elderly, or disabled passengers. Transit helps keep the people and the economy moving. It keeps our rural communities vibrant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Learning a lot today. All right, um, the last two speakers I have uh, in the uh, sign-up list are Naz Nurkadi and Josiah or Josiah Gregg. Welcome to the committee. Go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you so much. Hi there, my name is Abdel Nasser Nurqadi. I work with Move Minnesota. You can just call me Nas. I have been a transit rider my whole life here in America uh, and transit has made my life possible. It's how my immigrant mother took me to my eye doctor appointments. It's how I explored and played. Transit was the means of which I obtained my education. Even today, the bus and the light rail got me here. And in a manner of speaking, transit provided me with the tools to advocate for itself. As an experiment this winter, to put my money where my mouth is, I have gone totally car-free 
I'll take the bus and the light rail to work 10 miles away, or to visit my parents 11 miles in the other direction, or to friends or for groceries. The point being is that I do this. And because of my experience, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that we could do better. I can endure the transit in this cold. I'm young enough, I'm tough enough, but still, they say at negative five degrees Fahrenheit, it takes less than 10 minutes for frostbite to pounce on exposed skin. Late this past Sunday, my connection bus dropped me off at my next stop with 30 minutes to spare at negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Transit riders are often put in life or death situations just like that, and God forbid it's even worse when there are delays. And if you expect this transit system to work as it is now, you are asking riders to gamble their lives as they did this last weekend and the weekend before that. But what choices, though, what choices there for those who cannot afford the alternatives or for those physically unable to drive? To suffer, endure, you have to choose to refuse that reality. It's why we work now at Move Minnesota, advocating and fighting for everyday Minnesotans guilty of only trying to get from one place to another. Thank you again for listening to this testimony, and I implore you to fight even harder for transit this year. And thank you to everybody for showing up and showing out, and thank you to the committee for hearing us. And I'm sure you'll see us over at Move Minnesota a lot over the next couple of months as we fight together to make transit better. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Craig. Welcome. Please introduce yourself formally for the record and proceed. Hi, I'm Josiah Gregg. Um, I'm a resident of the Midway neighborhood of St. Paul, and also uh, I attend uh, St. Paul 350 and MN350 meetings. Um, I live in the Midway neighborhood of St. Paul within walking distance of the Green Line. My girlfriend uses the Green Line to get to her job in Minneapolis and previously used the 21 to get to St. Louis Park. Transit is a core part of our lives, but remains a frustrating experience for both of us. This is due to safety concerns, as well as the low frequency even of these vital parts of our transit system. There are few things as infuriating as missing a train you thought you would make. The Metro Green Line in the Twin Cities is one of the best transit services in the state, yet it still only comes every 15 minutes. Waiting every 15 minutes for a bus or train is frustrating, especially when it's negative 10 degrees out. It is frustrating when the train has one of the highest riderships in the Twin Cities. Increasing the number of drivers and operators of the buses and trains could increase its frequency. Sadly, the opposite is happening right now. We dread the quarterly route changes as they have only included cuts in routes and decreases in frequency. People use pr public transit when it is fast, frequent, and reliable. A 15-minute frequency, even on the busiest transit routes, is not enough. This 15-minute frequency, as opposed to, say, five, seven and a half, or 10-minute frequencies, reduce the number of people who will use transit. It also decreases how safe we feel using transit. If the train comes frequently, people will get off it. People will get off the bus if they feel safe. If the train or bus comes every 15 minutes, every half hour, every hour, transit riders instead feel like they have to stay on that train or bus, especially if it is cold or dark out. Finding dedicated revenue streams to increase operator and driver wages could be used to reverse the frequency and route cuts. This in turn would allow people to use transit more, increase how safe people feel using transit, and generally induce new demand for riding transit. I hope policymakers will find new dedicated funding streams to make this happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Gregg. I will now invite anyone who would like to approach the table to share their thoughts. And we're allotting about two or three minutes per person. So welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. Mr. Hi, I'm John Cunningham. I'm a retired architect from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And while sitting here today, I had no idea that I had taken transit for granted. I've been traveling around Minneapolis on the transit system for 60 years. Well, actually, I should say 70 years. 
And Minneapolis is the smallest city I ever lived in. Boston's transit, Philadelphia's transit, New York's transit uh, is a lot better. Foreign transit is so much better, it's hard to believe. I just recently visited a friend in Munich, Germany. When I lived there in the 60s, Munich had no subway system. They put it in. Now, it is almost foolish to get in a car in Munich because it's much more convenient to ride the transit system. And I'd never seen a transit system that worked that well. It, the repeating refrain today is one of more often, you don't have, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. All we have to do is do it more often and more reliable, and especially with the weather we've got. But I'm, I'm here to say that there are simple solutions and they should be funded so, and will greatly increase the quality of Minneapolis life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Great to see you. It's been a while. We share a friend, uh, Dore Mead. So great to see you. Um, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair Dibble, members of the committee, my name is Kelly Gregg. I'm an ER nurse in the Twin Cities area. Um, I just want to say two things. One, in response to NASA's comment about frostbite, it's something that I see and want to encourage you to consider um, the potential for injuries with long, uh, long waiting times. It, it's not necessary that those long waiting times take place. Um, and increased uh, service availability, I think, would alleviate that. The other thing I want to mention is um, just to shadow what the person next to me had said, and that a sign of um, an affluent society is a better transportation system. We've already started it. We've got a, a, a wonderful start for the transportation system here in Minnesota, but you have the opportunity to make it much better um, with frequency of the available uh, shuttles, um, trains, what have you. Um, and to not just do it for the metro area, but to do it for outstate as well. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you so much. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good evening, Chair, uh, committee. Um, I'm coming as a lifelong bus and train rider, um, as a teenager taking a bus to school, as a parent taking my kids to school on the bus, um, as a single adult taking a bus and train, um, I've been one to see a bus drive past me coming early. I've been one to have a bus not come at all scheduled. Um, I've been one to actually pay for a couple of my kids and a couple of their friends as well and basically almost pay $20 just because I wanted to get my kids and their friends to a park to enjoy their day as a parent. Um, but the things that I've been through, I'm basically coming to speak as of what I see through my eyes of taking a bus in the train um, for the individuals that haven't had the opportunity to come up today or maybe don't know about these meetings. You know, seeing homeless people on the bus, I look at it as they're, they're speaking out and they're crying out to you. you know, regardless of they're there, they're looking actually to the transportation committee and transportation and saying, we're here, you see us, you have cameras, you have riders, you have everyone here to see us, but you're not helping us. I see people that see trash and things on the bus and the trains, and they're looking at it as you don't care about the bus, you don't care about the trains, you don't care about your citizens because you're not doing anything about it. As I sit here and I listen to the individuals that are here, they're actually reaching out to you. And I know you're behind there because you want to hear about, you know, basically what your citizens are saying, um, which I appreciate your time. And if I didn't say it, I'm James Bradford III. Uh, not knowing if I said it or not. Um, but I'm here just to talk about those personal things as I've seen it with my own eyes. And I think some of the things that's of safety and the things that go on with the buses or trains are because people are actually communicating to you non-verbally. They're communicating you to the understand through their eyes what they're going through. Not that you're going to make a decision and go back to your homes and drive and be fine with it. They're actually saying, hey, I have mental health issues. We have buses and trains that go by hospitals. For whatever reason, I can't get the help that I need, but you're transit, and we're writing your service, and I want you to please help me. They're speaking out to you in a different type of way. 
So as I am trying to be here and speak for those individuals that have not been able to hear or underserved or no one listened to them, and you're granting me this opportunity to listen to me, I just want you to take that into point when you think about the funding, how much funding is greatly needed for ambassador program for the buses and trains to be welcoming environments for your bus drivers, your train drivers, that actually have to do these extra things to help with someone with a disability on a bus, that if an ambassador can help relieve their stress, help your employees, help the ride be welcoming to the community or to the community. I'm here to just say, as of even paying, like I said, for five kids because they're above the age of five, but they're below the age of 16, paying almost $20 for a ride because it's rush hour. And I've been one that's paid about $8 and change in my lifetime at certain times just so my kids can go to a park and enjoy the services that the city of St. Paul provides. So just wanted, you know, just to say, think of things when you make these decisions as of the funding, as of not just a decision you're making right now, but a decision as of your community, your citizens, as of what someone's saying to you non verbally Thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate your thoughts. Would anyone else like to testify? All right, seeing none. Members, uh, questions, comments, uh, conversation? Mr. Chair, I just have a comment, a remark. Uh, I heard um, at least three people, uh, including Ms. Nix, mention about the cold weather that we hear. We can avoid that, you know, and uh, uh, I think that's something to also consider as, as we move forward building, uh, sh you know, like bus stop, uh, shelter, you know, to to make sure that it, it cover that part. Um, I have a complaint all the time uh, from my constituents, you know, in the area where predominantly uh, are Somali uh, American resident that you know they're needs are not paying attention to because then just need a heater at the bus stop and uh, the the um, the reason that they have not accommodated that is due to ridership you know there's area that they said there's not enough ridership so they're not gonna um, build you know a, uh, um, a enclosed bus stop or have a heater equipped um, and so I just thought that I pointed out and, and you know Emphasize a little further on the needs of heater in in, in our stop, you know. So, um, yeah, just an extension what of what our testifier had been saying that we have cold weather, but we didn't mention about the the uh, enhancement of our shelter. And so, the the bus stop that I mentioned in my area has not been equipped with that for a long time, and it probably may not be in the future due to ridership, but folks that need it uh, really, really have to have a heater. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Herr. Committee members, any thoughts, comments? You look, you look like you're about to say something, Senator. I can always tell when Senator Carlson is well, gearing up to say something. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do have a lot of things to say, but uh, I think some of the things we need to do is we need to discuss some of what we heard here about um, the uh, uh, cold, the shelters, the frequency of trains, the reliability, all of that. But there's always something that is in the back of my mind, and that is the safety. Uh, I don't know how many people have been killed on our uh, surface trains. Uh, since we started the the, uh, uh, the Hiawatha line, but uh, that's that is something that I think we need to make sure that we're we're cognizant of. And I'm I remember talking to you, Mr. Chair, uh, back in 2007 when uh, before we had even talked. To, well, we hadn't approved the green the uh, green line yet, and uh, um, I had ridden back from Europe with a. Uh, a young lawyer from uh, Barcelona, Spain, and what she said to me is that uh, we will not allow any more surface trains because the number of people who have been killed by surface trains this is Barcelona. And uh, at the same time, I think there was a, um, a subway line in Moscow being built that was the pride of the country. 
and that's that's something that I think you know that we we don't realize what advantage it is by having uh, some of these lines be uh, subway lines, where you can have you know a major part of development underground and it can be comfortable for us. It can bring us to the destinations we want. Um, in the case even of the uh, Mall of America, you have to go outside between the, where you come in with the, the green line and go into the Mall of America. But I don't have to wear a coat when I drive my car there because I can just go zip right from the parking ramp into the, into the mall. Um, but I think we need to look at that, that these are hundred year, maybe longer investments. And uh, what we need to do is make them uh, comfortable, make them usable for a long time, and uh, uh, maybe use them for other things as well, uh, not just have them be uh, you know, temporarily for the use for the homeless. So I think it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really strongly promoting that we upgrade our transit system that it needs to be something that we, we're proud of and anybody will use it and you can get anywhere in the, uh, in the metro area. So that's, that's what goes through my mind, Mr. Chair. So thank you for calling on me. Thank you. Members, anything further? So um, I'll just wrap up by saying um, I learned so much today. Um, let me again just ask everyone if, if you're so inclined Please provide your written testimony um, to our uh, committee administrators because um, I'd like to go back and reread everything everyone said because there's a lot to synthesize. And as you might know, this is a budget year. Um, and so uh, prioritizing resources and making sure that we're affecting policy through the use of those resources is my goal. Um, and my goal is to be responsive to a lot of what I've learned here today about what transit um, and other forms of access and mobility mean and, uh, and making sure that we're fulfilling the aspirations of, of everyone and all the thoughts that were represented here. Um, and so, um, so please, um, also if you have very specific ideas, I heard a number of specific policy ideas, please advance those to us um, because the way the language of legislators is legislation. Um, and so we'll be working on developing a package of policy proposals that um, are part of our our budget package. Um, and then what happens um, is we have hearings on the budget proposal. So I invite you all back um, to, uh, as, we, as we roll out the budget in the proposal, um, to respond to that with a reaction and input, um, both informally through your elected representatives and also formally, again, at this table because the process is that we roll it out, then we invite testimony, and then we amend it, um, hopefully to improve it based on your input at that point. And that happens um, in about a month, a month and a half. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, this was an awesome, amazing hearing. Um, your passion, your intelligence, your experience um, is extremely valuable. It's the only way this democratic process, this process of representative democracy actually works and functions. Um, and so continue to stay in relationship and in conversation and communication with all of us. All right, with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.